Last week, the U.S. House Energy and Commerce Committee passed a revised version of the Waxman-Markey Climate Change Bill, which now waits to be debated in the House. The committee's website claims that the bill will see emissions in the U.S. drop by 17 percent by the year 2020, due to the creation of a cap-and-trade emissions allowance market. However, the true amount of U.S. emission reductions is obscured by this figure due to a practice known as carbon offsetting. Industries are given allowances to pollute. And let's say, you know, I'm a cold fire power plant and I say, you know, I, I'm going to pollute more than the allowances that I've been given. Uh, so what I can do is I can essentially offset um, my additional pollution. And the way I can do that is by supporting a project uh, in, a, in a developing country or within the United States in a sector that's not capped, such as agriculture. And I will get those emission reductions. So instead of uh, reducing emissions with my project, I essentially reduce it with another project. The Waxman-Markey bill is proposing that uh, two billion offsets would be allowed, and you know, two billion offsets each year is not um, peanuts. That uh, translates into approximately uh, 30 percent of uh, U.S. emissions in 2005. And so what that would mean is if um, industries hand in the maximum allowable number of offsets, uh, instead of having emission reductions in 2012, the first year of the bill, we would not have emission reductions until 2027. And unfortunately, what the science tells us is we need um, emission reductions on the order of 25 to 40 percent by 2020 relative to 1990 which translates into probably relative to 2005, we're talking on the order of 30%. But because of the use of offsets, what that actually um, means in the U.S. is we wouldn't even have any emissions reductions in 2020. Advocates of carbon offsetting, which is currently being practiced in the EU carbon trading scheme, argue that emission reductions anywhere in the world are just as valuable as reductions in the United States and that offsets will make the transition to a green energy economy smoother for all involved. But there are many reasons to believe that offsets do not and will not function as has been imagined. One of the largest issues is you have to prove that this project is additional and what that means is this supposedly clean project that we're, um, that's being supported in a developing country is indeed resulting in additional uh, emissions reductions and it would mean that this project could only go forward with this additional funding because I want to buy the offset and essentially you would have to know what would have happened if I were not willing to buy this offset which is essentially impossible to do and so the CDM the clean development mechanism which is the largest um, offsets market uh, in the world administered under the UN through the Kyoto Protocol from that system, we know that 76% of the projects that received um, offsets were actually already built um, at the time they applied for offsets credits. Um, additional problem is that many of these projects are um, not clean, uh, nor do they have um, stringent social standards. And in fact, 27% uh, of the projects are um, large hydro projects. Hydro is not necessarily clean, it's not a new technology, um, so it shouldn't be funded um, under such a program. In part one, we explored how the trading of carbon allowances makes room for the development of a secondary derivative market. Offsets, Parak believes, also represent a risky financial instrument. You can think of these offsets credits as derivatives or futures um, because the way the CDM works is I'm a project developer, I submit a, a, a proposal um, to, be, to receive um, offset credits from the clean development mechanism and then it has to be sent to a consultant, a third party verifier who decides whether my um, project is additional or not. And there's a clear conflict of interest because I, as the project developer, actually pay the third party verifier. So the third party verifier, of course, is hoping that in the future I will bring more projects for them to verify. So they want my business. So of course, um, they tend to be fairly lax in um, enforcing um, or testing for additionality. The potential for fraud is extremely high, and we already know that, for example, Credit Suisse has done something where they take a number of offsets projects and they bundle them together, 
and uh, some offsets projects are better than the others because there are some off there are a portion of offsets projects that truly are additional and are truly um, supporting clean technologies, but they bundle them together with projects that are much higher risk and where it's not very clear that the emission reductions will be all that large. And then again have tranched them and are, are trying to sell them on the market again. So um, it, it, you know, can draw a lot of parallels um, to what's just happened. And at this, case, uh, at this time, one and a half years after Wall Street started to collapse, we still don't have um, new safeguards in place for regulating um, these trading markets. Thanks in large part to offsets, the Waxman-Markey bill will not compel the phasing out of coal, the greatest source of CO2 production, in the foreseeable future. Over 50% of the United States electricity comes from coal, and this demand has fueled the growth of the process known as mountaintop removal. MTR employs the use of explosives to flatten mountains, exposing low sulfur coal deposits. The process, used primarily in the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia and Kentucky, has been steadily increasing over recent years as it allows coal companies to lay off thousands of workers, given that it's less labor intensive than traditional underground mining. Last week alone, a total of 17 West Virginians were arrested in three separate attempts to non-violently disrupt mountaintop removal mining activities. Beyond the permanent altering of the local landscape, resistance to mountaintop removal has been fueled by concerns over local environmental and public health effects. While offsets would permit continued coal extraction in the U.S., the practice has also come under fire for the ostensibly green projects they finance abroad. Uh, Xiaoxi project in China, this project, although it was completed um, at the time of application, was uh, awarded offsets credits, and there are very minimal um, environmental and social uh, standards that these projects must, must meet, and one of those is to actually meet with um, affected communities, and uh, this was not done. Um, so what, what we essentially have is a project that is not additional and um, displaced people who were not informed of any of their rights uh, before this happened. Donate today and receive a new documentary film available to members of the Real News Network. The History of the National Security State with legendary author Gore Vidal. Bonus features of the DVD include an in-depth response to Vidal from ex-CIA analyst Ray McGovern, who served under seven U.S. presidents, an exclusive interview with Colin Powell's former chief of staff Larry Wilkerson, and an insightful interview with oil policy analyst Antonia Yuhas. The news magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Hollywood and Washington is a symbiotic relationship. They both deal with illusions. Reality doesn't often uh, play much of a part. I think I saw through the myth of the uh, Cold War almost from the beginning. I was a Washington political kid from a political family. Roosevelt first had radio because he had a this great speaking voice that everyone liked to hear. Truman proceeded to break every arrangement that Roosevelt had set up for a peaceful coexistence. And Truman thought that it would be a good idea. Why not just stay armed all the time? And then he devised the national security state. You've got to go up and swear allegiance to the United States or else you're a commie. I mean, we, were, we had imported fascism. We get Dwight Eisenhower who said that we have this great military industrial complex. It is a dangerous thing. And he said, this is going to change everything. And the way our country's governed, it's going to change us politically. Along comes Jack Kennedy, who wanted to make his mark, believed in the Cold War. But he said, in this kind of politics, it is the appearance of things that matter. I think everybody should take a sober look at the world about us. The national security state still exists, only it isn't communism anymore, it's terrorism. This is the most serious thing that has happened in the history of the United States. 
Knowledge is power. We need an honest news system. We need the real news. This is the sort of thing we can build right now without anyone else's permission from the government or from the business community. It's the powers in our hands. If we're not going to sleepwalk into more wars, we think we need to start with a television news network that won't bow to pressure and has the courage to seek facts. And that means independent economics. And that's why we need you. Make a tax-deductible donation now of at least $10 a month or a one-time give of at least $75. As a thank you for your support, we will send you the new documentary film, The History of the National Security State.